This is Chris Albert, and I'm here to remind you of one thing. Someday, you're going to die. Now, that's not some morbid statement or scary idea. It's a solid fact. Your time here on this earth is limited. And you need to be reminded of this as much as possible for one simple reason. To live your best life while you can. This is the Warrior Soul Podcast. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Warrior Soul Podcast this week. And I've got a really awesome guest this week. His name's Matt Sapala. He's a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, and he's known as the money smart guy throughout social media. Now, Matt owns an insurance agency, and he's been in this business for quite a while, and then he partnered up with a guy named Patrick Bet David over at the PHP agency. Uh, if you don't know who Patrick Bet David is, he's all over YouTube uh, talking about capitalism, talking about running a business, and I wanted to bring Matt on this week because I watched one of his videos, and it was absolutely inspiring. You know, his goal is to educate people on financial literacy. And one of the things he's trying to slam home to communities that he works with is that capitalism is an awesome thing. It allows you to be able to pursue your dreams, to pursue a life that you want, and it really is the best way to go. And so what he's been doing is educating people on financial matters, mentoring people, so many people on how to run their own businesses and how to run their own insurance agencies. And it's he's, he's just a really great guy. Like I said, he's a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, and we had a great time talking today. Before we get into that conversation, I just want to say a couple of things. If you haven't been to this podcast before, this is the Warrior Soul Podcast, and my name is Chris Albert. And the reason why I started this podcast a few years ago is because, well, over the past decade and a half of war, the U.S. veteran community has been facing a whole host of different issues, ranging from really high veteran suicide rate to high rates of homelessness to high rates of chronic disease. And there's been a lot of people out there trying to raise awareness about these issues. But here's the thing. I want to do more than just raise awareness. I'm not just trying to stop veteran suicide. I really want to help all veterans to truly live. And that means that we need to be delivering solutions rather than just raising awareness. And that's what this podcast attempts to do. I tried to deliver tools, tactics, and strategies to help the U.S. veteran community to live their best lives. And if you're not a veteran, hang around here because all of these tools can really be applied to anybody. So that is what we're about. And on Mondays, we release interviews like this with awesome and amazing people. Last week, we had Captain Dale Dye, who is a military advisor to Hollywood. He's helped create things like Saving Private Ryan and the Pacific and Band of Brothers. Um, and we've had a lot of other amazing guests on as well. And this week is no different with Mr. Matt Zappala. Um In addition to that, we also have our Wednesday fitness notes. That's where I answer questions about fitness and health and nutrition. That's my background. I am a trainer and strength and conditioning coach. And then on Fridays, we do our warrior notes. And those are just short episodes that go into a mental tactic that you can use to gain better mental strength and be better prepared for this life. So in all, I hope you find all of these episodes helpful. And all we ask for in return is that you let people know about the show. You spread the word about it, share these episodes out, and if you can, pay us the highest compliment that you can by writing us a positive written review over on iTunes. It really helps with the show growth, and it really helps to get people to understand what we're about. Beyond that, I just want to say that this podcast would not happen without the good people at F-Bomb Nutrition. They make awesome, delicious packets of fats. And I'm a huge fan of their macadamia nut butters. They mix them up with chocolate. They mix them up with sea salt, with coconut butter. They're so good. No sugar in them at all. 
and that's my dog barking. Um, but we're going to keep going. No sugar in them at all. And, uh, you know, you can get 20% off of your first order of F bombs over at www.dropandfbomb.com when you use the code Warrior Soul at checkout. And with that, I'm going to stop talking right now and let's get into this conversation with my devil dog brother, Mr. Matt Sapala. Matt Sapala, man, how you doing? Outstanding. Semper freaking fried, devil dog. <laughs> Semper fi, my man. Dude, so last week I watched one of your videos and it just inspired the hell out of me. And, uh, you know, yeah. having been in this game for a while, you know, a lot of times I'm looking around on the internet and, and my bullshit detector is like way up to here. But I was like, this dude is a real honest dude who really wants to help people. So I did some, some more searching, found out you were a veteran. And I was like, this guy's got to be on the Warrior Soul podcast. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. Dude, I'm just humbled that you even said that, brother. So I appreciate it. Honored to be on. Absolutely, man. So let's get a little bit of the backstory. Um, you served in the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, when, when did you start, man? So I was uh, 91 and 99. That was my time. Um, officially got out in 02 uh, because I was in the reserves. Mm. But active duty straight up. Uh, eight years in Marine Corps. You know, my, my tour of duty was the Persian Gulf War. It was uh, Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, Africa. I was an instructor duty. I was, I was a helicopter mechanic, crew chief, door gunner, and a 50 cal. So that was part of my thing. I was part of the 15th Marine Expedition Unit, 31st Marine Expedition Unit out of Okinawa. Uh, so the, you know, the last two years of my my time was was straight up instructor duty, which I think was the most glory freaking field part of my Marine Corps career, is being able to teach Marines, being able to teach the new up and coming, you know, Lance Corporals and Corporals, how to make sure that they you know, are operating in a field of, in a, in a, in a theater of combat and come back home safely to their loved ones. So um, that, that was my time, and it was, it was just, you know, uh, packing a whole lifetime of stories and experiences in eight years. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, it's funny how the military comes for full circle with like that, because, you know, everybody has an impact on the next generation. Everybody has an impact on the next generation and the things that, that one generation learns, it gets passed down, and then so on and so forth. And it's kind of like this evolving body of knowledge that we're constantly going through. Right, right. Because, you know, the first, maybe your first enlistment, you're kind of figuring out I'm a private first class. I'm a Lance Cooley, just figuring my MOS. I only have maybe a year, two years in a fleet. By the time, you, you know, two, two and a half years in a fleet, by the time you got out, you know, I, I got done with, you know, MCT and got done with my um, helicopter training school and, and crew chief school and door gunner school. And then you're in the fleet. And I remember coming, I'm coming out of school and like, dude, those are freaking helicopters. Yeah. <laughs> I fly one of those. Can I go? And says, yeah, you want to go on a float? Um, yeah. What does a float do? Yeah. They deploy all over the world. I want to go. <laughs> yep. What's the next thing we're going out? And it says, uh, and then next thing you know, we went out and next thing you know, we're on our way to Australia. We go to Hawaii, on our way to Australia, Singapore, on our way to Australia. And I'm right. And next thing you know, the whole, the whole you know, the whole ship's captain's whistle. I can't even barely whistle right now, but the whole ship's captain's whistle. This is the captain speaking. You know, uh, we are being redirected, right? Mm-hmm. And they say, you know, we're, we're going into combat. We're going to the war. And it's like, well, I thought we were about to have fun. I'm about to take some pictures. I'm about to go visit Australia. Rock Foster's for Bia, right? And next thing you know, bro, we're going into war. Oh, and, man. And, and, oh, and man. Like, and, and you were headed up to the Persian Gulf from there? Yeah, yeah. Persian Gulf. And you're... You know, it's kind of weird when they say, Sapala, go down to legal and then make sure your SGL is intact and make sure your will is signed. Like, what? 18 years old. I mean, the last thing an 18 year old, 19 year old is thinking about doing is making sure their beneficiaries are in order and their will is signed. Like, who are you going to give all your money to? I'm like, what? My, my SGL, my mom. I don't yeah. have nobody. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was that, that experience like? Because, you know, the Persian Gulf Wars, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a, you know, it was so much, I guess you could say enthusiasm around that. I, re, I was a little kid when that was going on and I was watching it going on on TV <laughs> and, and you're like, you know, that, that, uh, there, there was so much kind of pride that we were, were protecting this country, Kuwait. And, you know, you're watching it on TV. It seemed like the media was completely behind it. What was it like actually being out there? Just the same situation with all my combat tours, especially coming up, is I didn't know what the heck was going on. I didn't know what the big picture was. Mm-hmm. What the hell's Kuwait? What the hell's Somalia, Africa? What are, what's me dealing with the UN? All we knew is this is our mission. 
you know, and, and when our company commander says, you know, 30% of you guys are coming back, that's why you need to get this stuff filled out. You're like, you're kind of freaking out. You're writing letters home. Uh-huh. Uh, but, you know, I didn't, brother, I didn't know what those, I didn't even know the geography of where we're at. I mean, Persian Gulf, what the hell is Persian Gulf? You know, so I, you know, lack of, you know, it's not like they, uh, the Marine Corps recruited some of the smartest people in, in, in the United States where multicultural middle-class kids come from nowhere just looking for a job, just looking for a career after high school. So I, I think for the most part, I understand it now. Mm-hmm. But when I was going through it, not knowing the geography, not even knowing the geography or the, the, the realm that I was in, it was just, you know, how do I just survive the next day and how to make the most of, of the information that they give us and do our mission and come back home. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, um, you know, talking about the Marine Corps is kind of like this multicultural society. You know, I was looking at my playlist a couple of weeks ago and I've got, you know, NWA, I've got, <laughs> Ice Tea, I've got Waylon Jennings, I've got David Allen Coe and, you know, all these things that just don't go together. And I got that, I think from the Marine Corps, you know, it's yeah. just, it's just like, you know, being exposed to so many different types of people and, and, uh, uh, you know, just a great time in your life. And, you know, aside from the obvious dangers and everything like that, you're young, you yeah. don't have any bills, really, you don't have to worry yeah. about really paying rent, you don't even have to worry about what you're going to put on that day, because you know what yeah. you're going to put on that day to wear. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great time where you can just focus on mission at hand and learn. Uh, and being around people that that you know and that that you you like and that well most of the time like but uh but yeah. uh you know it's it's it, it's a great time that I think a lot of young people while they're in just don't get and us as older guys can look back and we can say damn that was a good time in my life yeah, yeah especially right now in this era where racial tensions are so high. You know, I, I reflect back on my Marine Corps career. Did I see the fact that a guy was white? Yes. Did I see a guy was black? Yes. Did I see a guy was brown? Yeah. But I saw them for who they were, but that's not who, that, that's not what they were. Mm-hmm. Right? The, the outside is, you know, white, black, brown. But, but what do they teach in the Marine Corps? We're all green. Right. We're all dark right. green, light green. Because at the same time, brother, bullets and bombs, it's, it's not racist. If you're in the way, you don't have your head down. If you're not doing your job, it, it's going to come after you. And so um, I learned to embrace um, our differences, not, be, not to be divided by them. And I think of America today was, was to look at things like that. Um, I remember, yeah, listen, Tupac, talk, Tupac talked about thug life. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you talk about those different, uh, Biggie, Biggie Smiles, all, the, all those different things. And, you know, I'm thinking about reflecting on that. You're right, because you go into a barracks, one side you hear country music, <laughs> other side you hear heavy metal. Other side here, R&B, other side here, hip hop. But you know, at the end of the day, we ran in the same formation, man. Yeah, man. And, and it's the funniest thing because I remember first time going out on Libo, I, I was in ITB, Infantry Training Battalion, right? And, uh, the, you know, you're talking to these guys and you don't, you don't recognize where they come from, really. You might hear the accent or something like that, but we're all getting ready to go out for liberty. And I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Connecticut. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So, we have a, a, you know, an Italian guy, you dress a certain way and everything like that. So I'm there, I show up, I got leather shoes on, I got jeans, I got a button up shirt, got my hair like spiked up with whatever I could because it was a high and tight, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then uh, my, my buddy show up and you got a dude who's dressed in like baggy clothes with his like collared shirt t- tucking in, but even though it still looks kind of you know, it looks kind of hip hop. And then you got a guy who was wearing cowboy boots, a huge belt buckle and everything like that. You don't realize yeah. it until you get dressed up the libo. That's so funny. Yeah. You see the, your differences or the guy that wears core frames in his jeans. You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> yep. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know? Exactly. Well, dude, how did you, how did you first get interested in finance and, and money? I got interested in finance because I took a green monster, a green logbook. And I did my, do, my, my, my best to track my money. Mm-hmm. And I get a $400 check or a $600 check or $800 check every two weeks. And I know it sounds kind of crazy for me to even say that, but I remember those are my checks. And I kind of put it out in a ledger where my money would go. Mm-hmm. You know, so I did my best. And this is the days before direct deposit. So you either had, a, you had it in the Navy Federal Credit Union mm-hmm. or you had cash in your wallet. Right? You cashed your checks this, you know, before we got direct deposit. That was until I decided to get married. 
right? And then the whole budget just flew out the window. You had a kid, boom, budget flies out the window. And you realize, dude, I can't even support myself as a corporal in the Marine Corps, in the military, E4, over two years, over four years, over six years. Then I need to get promoted, man. And how do you get promoted? Well, you got to you got to go through meritorious boards and you got to take the hazardous duties. You got to go deploy more. Mm-hmm. So I deployed to make another extra, extra hundred bucks here and have CPA, you know, have all that extra stuff. And, or I remember Sergeant Satchel when I was in uh, Okinawa, he had six kids as a Sergeant in the Marine Corps and it was locked on Okinawa. He's from Chicago, but he's locked in Okinawa. Couldn't really come, come back to stateside because he loses overseas pay. Right. And so I really started understanding, man, you know, dude, we are getting locked in pigeonholed in our career because of finance, uh, financial, uh, our financial situation, our economic understanding or lack thereof. Right. And, that's, and not, that's not, you know, just the military. There's people out there doing jobs that they absolutely can't stand um, for, for the paycheck just, just to have it come yeah. in. They're, st- they're stuck there. You know, right. and that, that's a common story uh, amongst the American middle class right now, right? Yeah. And my, my, yeah. And, and my first wave of understanding that shock value was my experience in Marine Corps. You know, for most guys that are 17, 18, 19 years old in the Marine Corps, that's our first full-time job. Right. So I'm, I'm realizing, man, and, and it wasn't until a, a, a retired master sergeant who approached me of all places in the bathroom of a Best Buy right there in Lake Forest off of... Also, Parkway up to 405. He approaches me. I'm in a, I'm in a bathroom with my kids. Uh, and they're going to, you know, I'm helping them do their thing. And he asked me a question. Are you going to stay in the Marine Corps? I said, I'm a freaking lifer. Of course, that's the knee-jerk reaction, right? Yeah. And and I really, really believe I was a lifer. But, you know, that's what you were told, especially coming back from from a couple uh, deployments. Because now you're, you're salty. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, he said, wait. He asked me a couple of questions. Chris, he says, you, uh, you like money? I'm like, yep. He says, you like a lot of money? Yep. Okay, here's what, what hit me. Well, do you know the rules? No. Well, do you know anybody that knows the rules? No. So, but you like money. Don't You like a lot of money, but you don't know the rules, and you don't know anybody with the rules. It's like you're talking out of two different, two different sides of your mouth. Because if you, like, if you like the Marine Corps, if you like sports, you, you, you read books, and you're surrounded with it. Right? You listen to your – Right? But if you like money, you, you, you say you like money, but your actions prove that you really don't like money. I, if anybody helped me out with that, I said, no. Would you like some help? So anyway, make a long story short, he recruited me into the insurance industry my seventh year in the Marine Corps because I realized a career jammer uh, wasn't going to get me to the next um, financial level of my life. And based on the lifestyle I wanted to live, the freedom I wanted to have, I realized, man, the Marine Corps, because I was exposed to another world which is the, the, the rich side of San Diego, the rich side of Orange County, the rich side of, of Newport Beach and Balboa Island and Laguna, Laguna Niguel. Where, listen, I don't want to need to be on a USS warship. I want to be on that guy's 80-foot yacht. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to hear you say that because, you know, most of my time I was out at Lejeune. And, you know, the, I think the rich side of Lejeune was the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, like, like, like battalions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, when you're a young private and you're just heading out and there's so many things that you can waste your money on, there's car dealerships all over the place with ridiculous interest rates. There's, mm-hmm. there's, uh, and, and this might not sound politically correct, but there's women all around the base who are looking to get a piece of your paycheck looking to, yeah. to, to get yeah. a piece of that pie. And yeah. a lot, of, I saw a lot of guys get, get tied up with, with all kinds of BS like that. Um, there, <laughs> and then yeah. there's also the ancillaries. I mean, you had the liquor stores, the, the strip clubs and the, the, there was a, a place where you could give your blood for money. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I used that money to get my first tattoo, man. So, so <laughs> yep, yep. Yep. And, uh, and, and so, in that environment as a young Marine, you could have everything set up because like I said before, you don't really have to worry about many bills when you're younger. You don't have to worry about too much. You could have yourself set up if you play it smart, but if you're not smart about it and you start spending your money on crap, then in that case, you're going to get yourself locked up into one of those situations. And by the time you get married, by the time you start a family, you're going to be tied up 
and you might be stuck in a position, right? You know, I realized, Chris, after 10 years in the armed forces, eight years active duty, two in the reserves, you know, two and a half in the reserves, I realized that Uncle Sam paid me a quarter million bucks over 10 years of my life. And I've got nothing to show for it. But a bunch of stuff in my 1997 Nissan Maxima. Obviously, the only good thing that came out of it was my son, mm-hmm. who's now 23 years old. But that was it. But I, had, I, I couldn't rub two quarters together. Remember DPP, the deferred payment plan, yep. which is now A fees. Um, you know, just just getting you know owing money. If you don't owe money, if you owe money. They just jack it out of your checking account and they write a page 11 on you because you're not paying your bills. Right. So, you know, the, the shock, the shock there is two, you know, two, three months before I was supposed to get out, we take those TAPS class, those transition assistance, you know, transition assistance program classes, TAPS class. That's when I received my first financial education class. This financial planner comes on base. All of us are getting out. He starts telling us about the compound interest and how to budget and how to put your money on. Dude. Where were you at the beginning of my career? Because yeah. I don't need a budgeting class two months before I'm supposed to get. I got zero zero dollars coming at me, right? So, uh, and today still hasn't changed, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today: and educating veterans and entrepreneurs alike to be more money smart. That's awesome. So when you when you got into uh, selling insurance and in, in in the insurance industry. Um, what types of did did your mentor give you give you training? Did he did he uh, you yeah. know how how did you start with that? So I started I, I I would fly my missions at night so I could be at the financial firm during the day. So I volunteered a flight night you know night crew. So I'd fly from you know I have to be on base at sixteen hundred and we get done at zero one zero dark you know zero two zero dark thirty right. And so that allowed me to sleep for about five six hours to get to the financial firm by nine o'clock. Uh, Pacific time. So I can start just understanding this world and you know, wow, they're all rich people aren't jerks. And some of them were, of course, but you know, wow, that's what it's like to, to make that type of money to help a lot of people and the, the lingo they're saying on the phone and, the, and the, the clientele that they were helping. And I was just getting used to being around normal people, which is, I, I thought was kind of cool. And, uh, and he showed me his presentation. I was sitting and take notes on his presentations and I, after listening to about a dozen times, and I do it's the same joke, the same intonation, the same. Oh, that, that's how we. So it's a, he taught me a system of storytelling to to educate a client to trigger them emotionally, and that's why people buy insurance. So that's why people put money away for retirement or the kids' college education, because insurance and retirement services aren't something that people wake up every day and 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 buy. These are still things that people need to be sold, and so you sell it in a way that engages them so therefore they're empowered to buy right uh lots of guys in insurance industry sell 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 and they never get anywhere Uh, so you know he taught me that uh, process and then uh so i did that for 12 years and then uh, about you know 2010 2011 that's when i went into the media uh with uh with td ameritrade and msn money but yeah that's that's what he initially taught me what what types of obstacles did you have in your own head during that first year or so while you were doing it? Like what did you put up resistance? Did you did you try to try to, you know, say that the system wasn't gonna work for you or anything like that? What what was going on there? Oh yeah. I mean a whole lot of self-doubt. Because, you know, in the Marine Corps, even though you had doubt, you know, you kind of kept that to yourself. You kind of kept that to yourself and you still followed through with what the, whatever the mission was. Because you had camaraderie there with your brothers. Right. And in the civilian life, you have self-doubt, but nobody else is doing it but you. So you're kind of like wondering if this is the right thing to do or not. And when some I remember a client, I think objection handling was and handling, dealing with people's excuses. I couldn't deal with that. It's like, I don't want to do it. Well, I got to think about it. Listen, in Marine Corps, we never said I'll think about it. You know, uh, so, you know, uh, people, my family, this, my my wife, this, we still did it anyway. Mm-hmm. So I just realized civilians, man, I was like, there's a whole lot of, you know, can I really do this? Can I sell? Do I, do I got to choke everybody out? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so me adapting to the current new battlefield that I was in was learning this new skill of not scoping my target, but learning skills to communicate to my target, right? Learning to grow professionally with my mouth 
in my brain, in my ears, and I need to shut up. And I learn. I need to learn how to ask more specific questions so I can hone in. I can zero in on their their situation. And so um, I, I, I think um, with me coming out the Marine Corps, I had no problem with not having a boss. I think that's that was a very freeing thing. But I think just dealing with people that was the hardest thing for me to deal with. And I think today I still have some residual with that, and I'm still working on it today. You're still because working on that today, really? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on it today because it's that knee-jerk reaction when people give me excuses that the, the, you know, the Marine in me still kicks in. Mm-hmm. The athlete in me wants to kick in. You're like, you're right? you know, you know, like when, you know, like when you're spotting somebody, right? Chris, you're spotting, come on, let's give me two more. You know, yeah. uh, uh, people, you know, right? Give me one for the Marine Corps. You know, God, I mean, you know, people don't know how to do that in the civilian level comes to their finances. So how do I translate that from physically and vocally to mentally and, 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 and from a coaching, coachability standpoint. Did you ever accidentally knife hand anybody? <laughs> right? <laughs> double, double knife hand, man. Maybe, yeah, maybe turn it into a back, back slap, but yeah, pretty close. <laughs> so, so there was this kind of learning process. And, and like you said, it's, it's a lifelong learning process, trying to deal with your own resistance, deal with your own psychology. And, um, you know, you, you've, been able to grow into into a very major business, and you've done that by also recruiting others to to kind of mm-hmm. duplicate yourself. And when when did you start realizing that that was something that you could do, or or that that was something that that you should be doing to grow your business? A client was sitting across from me from a boardroom, and he goes over to sit next to me on the chair next to me. Yeah, uh, for a specific reason for Tim, him saying, I like your chair. What's, what's the difference between my chair and your chair? No, it's the same chair. But the difference between your chair and my chair, I, as your client, I get up from my chair, I go back to my dead end job that I dread. Mm-hmm. But you, you get up from your chair because you're on your own business. You do what you want. You go take your wife out for lunch. You go, you go, you go, go, go vacation. You can say, I'm going to make a lot of money this year. I like your chair. I like, I like the life that you're living. I like, I like your chair, brother. So I'm like, so, so Louie, you're, you're, you're asking me to teach you what I do. He goes, I'd love to do what you do. I'm like, dude, I don't know how to teach you, man. I guess you get licensed. I got licensed in California. I'm in Chicago. Now you get licensed. I don't even know how to tell you how to go and find your clientele. I just kind of fell into this thing. So what I realized that people love the life I was living. I just didn't have a way to teach it. And ironically here, Chris, I've got my first notes from 1998 that I took as an entrepreneur. Oh man. Right. And I've got, I've got notes in this thing. And, I, and by the way, I was a very bad student. If I was a good student, I would have been in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. But I became a good student because I know if I wasn't being a good student to grow and develop, that financially speaking, I'd be broke. And today, you know, these days, we put into a nice blueprint for our guys. But, but I didn't have a system or a process to teach what I knew, condense it into 30, 60, 90 days, and give, give it to other people. And I realized that people want to do what, I, what I'm doing because most people today are overworked. They're underpaid. They're underappreciated. They're undervalued. They're not happy. And so what I realized that the blessing that somebody gave me coming out the Marine Corps or to give me a choice to get out the Marine Corps, to give me an opportunity to go in business for myself, even though I was in, you know, even though I was in the insurance industry, it was still a blessing just to be an entrepreneur. And when you take people on uh, as agents, do they, is there any perception amongst them that as far as adjusting to this new type of work, do they have problems adjusting to the concept that this is work and that, that you do need to, to be disciplined about it? And, <laughs> and what types of obstacles do you commonly see there? Two different, op- two major obstacles. Number one is the guy that's having their, having to wrap their mind around digesting money in financial strategies and being able to communicate complex things in a very simple way. Right. And the most, the first person they got to sell is themselves because mm-hmm. the people that we generally recruit are people that love the lifestyle, but man, they don't want to do the work. Right. Right. It's like, dude, you want to make a hundred grand a year, but you want to take a, you know, $5 an hour mentality to this thing. Dude, if you want to make, if you want to do a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars income, you know, type reality, you got to do that type of work too as well. And you got to be a student of the business. You got to show up on time. You got to take notes. You got to attend conferences. You got to grow yourself professionally. So I think that, again, that's where my people skill has to evolve and coach people because the Marine in me was just to put them to boot camp, right? 
I just want to get him in line, you know, get him information, or as you said earlier, I want to knife pan him. The, the flip side to the, the obstacle to that is the guys that do get it. Mm-hmm. They, they become students of the business and they end up making a lot of money. They're making six figure incomes. The obstacle I face there is that they make so much money in such a short period of time and they think they work. Right. Hey, brother, you ain't working, man. Like, like one of our first ladies, she's an accountant. And uh, her first month here with us, she's about, she's about to make eight, nine thousand, ten thousand dollars in a month. It's more money she's ever made as an accountant. I think by the time the whole month uh, uh, ends up, she might make like 12 or 15 grand. She goes, I'll make more money in four months here, five months. Uh, I'll make more money here in one month than I will in four or five months, six months at my job. So, my, so what I have to sell to her is that business is all about ups and downs. Job gives you salary, right? But business gives you commission and, and, and profits and revenue, but you still have to keep the foot on the gas. Right. You just can't hang around the office. Bureaucracy, you show up, you get paid. Military, right? You, you, do, you do the least amount as you can to get away. You skate. Just to get your paycheck, and you get a, you skate, you do the least, but you get a paycheck. Right. In business, you do the least, you don't get paid. You don't, you know, you don't eat. Right. You, you better max out. So you know, so there's, that's the dichotomy that I'm facing. Guys that don't get it, they'll never, they'll, they'll never ramp up in business, and that's an obstacle. Second part, the second part of that is they do get it. They make a lot of money. I got, I got to convince them to get them back, back to work, but which, which is more fun. I think that that was more fun. And what types of, is there any traits you look for in agents, um, uh, you know, specific types of individuals or personalities or anything like that? Yeah, I think a competitive drive. Mm -hmm. They got to be competitive. Uh, They have to have a deep desire to want to be somebody. Got to have a chip on their shoulder. You know, they have something to prove. Um, You know, uh, I, I don't like, guys that are entitled, take off. You know, if you're entitled to success, be gone. Uh, are you entitled to, to do successful work here because you have a pedigree or you have a college or you, you, know, you have a resume? Forget about it. That's what I love about this field or the field of capitalism and the, the, the system of free enterprise and entrepreneurship. It's the level playing field, man. I don't care if you got a PhD or an MBA or a college degree, uh, GED can kick your ass because he's willing to do the work. So, you know, that's what I love about this industry. So those, those are some of the things, because I don't have a college, I still don't have a college degree. My wife and I, we run a multi-million dollar business. We bring seven figures a year. We still got a lot of work to do. And by the way, we don't think making seven figures is a lot of money either. Mm-hmm. I asked my wife the other day with, with a business and a family of, of now coming on five kids. We're, about, we're expecting one in February. Oh, wow. when, I said, when, when did you, yeah. I, I told her, babe, when did you start feeling a little bit of freedom? You know, when you start feeling a little bit of financial freedom, she says seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, that's with four kids and you know the right diet, the right you know you know savings, and we pay our taxes, and we're creating jobs, and we're putting money away. She started feeling freedom seven fifty a year. So, and 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 by the way, it's 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 getting more and more like that because I remember growing up, it was you know cheap to to, to the, the the cost of living was inexpensive than it is today. Right. It was a lot less expensive. Yeah, a lot less expensive. Yeah. And I remember, you know, um, $100,000 was a lot. You know, $100,000 oh, yeah. a year was a lot of money for a lot of people. And now that's, you know, people are complaining about it. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting. And it's, it's crazy yeah. how times have changed. 100%. I think, I think the fact is, uh, you know, I think it said four out of 10 people making $100,000 a year are feeling paycheck to paycheck. Wow. Yeah, I think according to USA Today, the financial freedom number to have your head at least above water was between 117 and 134 a year. Yeah. And it's crazy when you think about that on the global scale, because you know, yeah. something like $33,000 puts you in the 1% of, of the world, of the world yeah. right? And that's, that's, yeah. that's insane to think about. A lot of the world, they live on way below that. Like, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, you know, I was looking at some of the, the PHP agency videos, right. And, and I'm looking at, at, uh, you know, the way you guys do things. And it seems like you, it's like awesome, like party, <laughs> like people are, people are so happy and, and you guys are doing, doing these kind of rallies and everything like that. Tell me a little bit 
about the the PHP agency, why you ended up partnering with them, and, and why um, why it's different. Why is it different from the rest of the insurance industry? So I got introduced to Patrick Bed David by a mutual friend who's a pastor in LA, West LA. Uh, his name is Pastor Dudley Rutherford, who my sister introduced to him because she was working for him as a director of ministry. Mm-hmm. And by the the reason why my sister ended up in LA is because she was formerly in Orlando as an Orlando magic girl and a dancer for Disney. She wanted to be a Laker girl. Mm-hmm. And so instead of being a Laker girl, she found Jesus. Anyway, make a long story short, she introduced me to Patrick, uh, but David through Pastor Dudley Rutherford. And, and, and here's the thing, because in order for me to teach other people how to do what I did, I needed a system, I needed a process, and as you pointed out, I needed a culture. Right. Because the typical, the typical age, let me ask you this question, Chris. If I said the word financial advisor, I said the word insurance agent, and I needed you to put an illustration in the, in, in the, uh, in the brochure, an illustration for Webster's Dictionary, about who the typical insurance agent looks like, you know, based on age, gender, and, de- and um, nationality. So let's start with, uh, with, with uh, gender. What do you think the typical agent is, male or female? Typically, probably male. Yep, uh, typical male. Uh, older or younger? I would say probably younger. Um, okay. Most of the ones that I've ever dealt with were like mid-20s, something like cool. that. Cool. And then what nationality, ethnic background? Usually Caucasian. Yeah, so you got two out of three right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so it's it's typically male, it's typically Caucasian, and it's typically the typical insurance agent is fifty nine years old. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. So this year, one out of four insurance agents are out of the industry based on just natural attrition and uh, retirement. Right. So so the industry is facing as a whole because the, uh, the the current the current industry had failed to recruit another generation of insurance agents that's going to work under their wing to take over. It's like the Marine Corps not recruiting 18, 19, 20 year olds anymore. Mm-hmm. And they expect a bunch of sergeant majors and, and majors to run the military. Wow. You know, forget about it. Yeah. So that's what the insurance industry did. And wow. so, so number one, what makes us different is the average age is 33 years old. And we are a multicultural agency. 53% of our company is Latino. Oh, wow. So there's a, I'm, I'm Filipino by ethnic background, but there's a good 40% of my business that's Spanish speaking. And what, what I love about our system is that we're able to recruit and train and develop agents to go back into the marketplace, to go back into their demographics, educate their marketplace and give them, hey, if you don't know anybody in our marketplace that does this type of work, I do consider me the next time you think about money. Wow. Wow. And, and d- is that something that, was a strategy from the beginning or, or was that uh, developed over time? Was that something you guys ran into and, and just saw? For me, I, I got invited in 2007 to the first ever multicultural conference in, in Vegas at the MGM Grand sponsored by Allianz. And Allianz is, is pretty big. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, one of the largest financial groups in the world. Uh, everybody in Europe knows who Allianz is, A-L-L-I-A-N-Z. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I walk into MGM and for the first time ever, I see African-American, Latino, uh, I see um, uh, Asian, I see women. Women is a big minority in our demographic uh, marketplace, which of our companies, 53% uh, women, PHP agency is 53% women. The highest income earners of our company are women. And the industry just failed to recruit the, the, a multicultural demographic. And that was 100% the reason why PHP agency was started in October of 2009. It's going to be our birthday this Saturday, nine years in business. Oscar De La Hoya is an active investor in our, in our company that invested into the infrastructure or he invested $10 million into the infrastructure of our company to grow it. Wow. And so hundred percent, it was intentional from the get go. Wow. And you guys have like, there's like a multimedia platform too. I mean, the, the, the value attainment channel that Patrick Bet David does, that's, yeah. that's centered on, around a lot of what PHP agency does. Um, and th- there, there seems to be like a real educational backdrop to, to everything you guys do, right? Yep. Yep. It's how to do this, how to hire employees, how to, how, how to negotiate your next office lease, how to deal with anxiety and depression. How do you, you know, so there's a lot of things that helps any entrepreneur 
successful, regardless of they're with PHP and CNN. That's why we, that's why our CEO called it value tainment. Nice. And then, so with what you're doing with, with money smart guy, um, what, what was your goal with money smart guy? What, what, what have you been trying to do with that? And how, how have you been adding to that bigger picture? The initial goal in 08, 09 was because they couldn't say my last name in the media. You know, so I mean, I'm Chris. I God bless you, man. You said my first and last name properly. What a what a devil dog! I did some media, research on that. <laughs> but the media, they see my last name, Sapala. They said Sapala, Samula, Spatula. What the hell? You read my freaking last name, Sa Paula. Anyway, I was doing work with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and they had something called the Money Smart Week. Because they did so much work with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago pre- providing free financial literacy classes, they ended up calling me the money smart guy. So initially, the money smart guy was just because that was just my nickname. Be- it became a handle because people couldn't spell Matt, two T's, not one, or pronounce Sapala. So money smart guy just became the brand because it's so much easier to say. Mm-hmm. So my goal to, to answer your question is that the money smart guy is l- injecting capitalism, free enterprise, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial principles to the veteran community in transition or to any entrepreneur out there that's looking to uh, grow a business. So, so uh, you know, the whole world transition. And a lot of us, regardless if you're in the military, not, you know, I just sat down with an athlete, Spice Adams, two days ago, and uh, professional athletes are in transition. Mm-hmm. Like they were at this height of income and esteem of platform and exposure and then rapidly they become a has-been. Yeah, it's something like 75% of ex-NFL players file for bankruptcy in two years after they retire, right? That's right. We interviewed uh, um, uh, Anthony Walker, who had a $100 million career b- drafted by the Celtics, went to win a championship in, uh, in Miami. Today, he, he, he broke. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and by the way, it's usually the good guys that end up being broke because they can't say no to their crew. Right. Right. And so now, thank, thankfully, he's got a job with Northwest Mutual. He tells his story, gets recruited to speak at different colleges, that the student athletes about to go pro, about how to be smart with money. Nice. Nice. And, and so you're, you're focusing with your content on, on that veteran community there. I think that's awesome. You know, and the, one of the reasons why I think that's awesome is because one of the reasons why I started this podcast was because about five, six years ago, you know, when the veteran suicide issue was being brought yeah. forth, I saw a lot of people talking, putting the number 22 everywhere, trying to raise awareness, raise awareness, raise awareness, but nobody was really given solutions. Right. And, and I had a real problem with that. And, and what I see you doing here is you're actually giving viable solutions. You're actually showing people how they can set themselves up, you know, and, yeah. and money is not the key to happiness, but if you don't have money, I've been there before. Yeah. You're not very happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah money is definitely, a, you know, when, when people say well, it's not all about the money, well, kind of is because we live in an economic world. And so, you know, money ain't going to buy you happiness. You're right. It won't buy you happiness, but it sure removes a lot of distractions and arguments. Right. So, you know, you know, so, so, you know, my, my challenge is how to be more money smart when it comes to this type of conversation, because when, when you're, when you're considering, that most people have depression when it comes to lack of money or you know, lack of resources. And what I realized too, brother, is that the windshield, if you're going forward, the windshield is a whole lot easier to look at than the rearview mirror. Right. And all that shit you've been through, that's depressing to look at. And by the way, if you're going forward and you're looking at the rearview mirror, you're bound for an accident. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. so that's why I love entrepreneurship because I try to distract guys with competition. Right. I distract guys by starting a business. I distract guys so therefore they could be more hands-on and create a new baby, you know, and, and they have a new patrol. They have a new mission. They have a new agenda that they're now pursuing and they want to develop something instead of having a service dog, which is awesome. Now you have a service business and right. it becomes your that 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 get that gets your focus on what's going on right now in the moment keeps your head out of you know all yep. that stuff from the past and and that's an important point that I think it was Evan Hafer brought that up at um at a uh, Clever Talks that the CEO of Black Rifle Coffee yep. uh, he was trying to to talk about you know even though it's very centered on being a veteran Black yep. Rifle Coffee is more 
about more than just being a veteran, right? It's, yeah. it's becoming a, a worldwide brand right now. And it's, yeah. it's, it's because he's focused on that, that, that windshield rather than the rear view mirror. Um, with, uh, with what you're doing right now, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see young guys making when they get out of the military, when it comes to, to financial success? I think that the number one is they don't plan for finding a career or a way to replace the money that they're really, that they were really making in the military when they get out uh -huh. and they just lean on the GI bill to live on. They lean on, you know, now here, you know, guys are living on 1600 bucks a month, $2,100 a month for the post nine 11 GI bill. Okay. But you know, here's what I understand too. like, a lot, there's a lot of guys or I see a lot of guys every day with a ton of education, but they're still not bringing in money. Right. So you, you know, so if, especially if you've got a family, especially now if you're single, I totally get it, you know, you know, shack up and, 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 and that's an area to be broke because you're only responsible for yourself. But number one is with that while still in the military, they buy a car with four year financing or they buy a house. I think one of the worst things veterans can do is actually buy a house. Why the hell are you going to buy a, th a, a house with a VA loan, you're obligated to pay for it for 30 years. You only might be in the military for four years in this specific area. Right. And to me, that's a big rip. And then they leave the, they leave the Marine Corps, they leave the military. It's not like the obligation to pay that mortgage is done. Or, or pay your car payment is still done. You still have to pay those things. And that adds just another barrier of stress, a burden of stress on, on, on a family and a, a young service members leaving the military. So that'd be number one. And just not being prepared for that transition um, from a reality standpoint. And the reality is, even though if you have six months to get or a year to get or three months to get out, they think they just don't need to work with urgency. So, brother, three months passes by just like that. Six months passes by. A year passes by. Just don't think you don't need to make the decision now and, and, and start fostering planting those seeds now. So, therefore, when you do get out, you have a year of making the right decisions. Versus starting from scratch when you when, when you get out. You know, so yeah, that that th there's certain things that are held up, you know, as carrots too. When, when even when you join the military, I mean, the concept of a, a of a VA loan to buy a house, right? That's something that goes back to like World War II, where you know, yeah. giving giving veterans an American dream, the GI Bill, right? And, and uh, I. I have to admit, I'm somebody who fell prey to that. I hid out in school forever, man. I got two masters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I, I was working on a PhD. I was living off of that post 9-11 GI Bill mm -hmm. and, and just doing it. And I'd seen a lot of veterans who were just going back to school just to get the GI Bill um, yep. even when they have families. And, yep. um, you know, I think that one of the things you need to understand, number one, a college degree isn't what it used to be. Yeah. Right? It isn't what it used to be. It's not a guarantee that you're going to make a, a, a living, right? Yeah. It's not even a guarantee that you're you're going to eke out a living. Number yeah. number two, um, you know, I I think that you have to understand your purpose in a lot of ways, and you really have to focus on finding that first yeah. before you commit yourself to going to college, buying a house settling down because you don't know what your purpose is when you're just getting out of the military and to tie yourself to a geographic location or to tie yourself to a degree, to a degree. Um, it's, it's kind of a, you know, limiting your options. Yep. And, and what I'm realizing too now that I've been out now for a minute, it's going on with 17, 16, 17. And so I've been out longer than I was actually in, which is kind of a weird evolution, but yet I still carry some, a lot of the, military uh, stuff with me, Marine Corps um, mindsets with me, that the, the Marine Corps, man, is, well, what a short period, what a short chapter it is that is of your life, mm -hmm. right? And you got to deal with you for another 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, you know, Lord willing. So, I, you know, and one of the great things about the Marine Corps or a military career is that you, ex you got exposed to so much in those three, four, five, eight year, whatever it was, that most people never live throughout their lifetime. And so I think a lot of military service members getting out don't give themselves enough credit for the work ethic and leadership and the type of person they're going to be to any company, let alone a business. Um, and, and because, you know, we, 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 we start for recognition. Like how many times you've been in formation? Like what the hell he's getting, an, he's getting a NAM. He's got a Navy commendation medal. I was busting my ass harder than he was. How come I, I'm not up there getting an award. 
I'm getting a medal on my chest. Well, here's a scenario. Now we're in business as an entrepreneur. You can get reward for what you do, man. And, and I don't think enough guys give themselves enough credit. They can do it. Right. Exactly. You know, and that brings up another point and, and I know we got to wrap up pretty soon, but um, I wanted to ask you this because just the way political times are, um, yep. you're, you're dealing with a, a multicultural segment of society with PHP agency, right? Yep. There seems to be this concept out there that democratic socialism or socialism might be a better way than capitalism. And, you know, from what I've seen of Patrick Bet David and, and yourself, you're trying to educate people about the virtues of capitalism and what it can do for people. Mm -hmm. What are people not getting? I think a, a lot of folks love the handouts. We love the benefits. We love those type of things. But the flip side to that, there's a, there's a cost to that. And in, in understanding capitalism, like if it's a level playing field and if you're willing to do the work, why should somebody else benefit from my work when they weren't willing to go after it? Right. So, so capitalism for us, both uh, Patrick and I, we do not have college degrees, but yet we run this, you know, decamillion, you know, we run this, you know, nine figure company. He's a decamillionaire. I'm a multimillionaire, but the degrees never defined us, but having a shot to be a, a capitalist and entrepreneur has. And so, you know, one of the, one of the uh, ways I'm teaching my kids, because the kids are going to school all the time and they're being exposed to, to a lot of liberalism, a lot of uh, socialism. And, and your, your father, matter of fact, I have him wear a shirt. I'm a capitalist. You know, I, I believe in capitalism. And, and just the pr basic principles of you bust your tail, you get rewarded. You work long, nobody gets in your way. But you're the one that benefits from all, all that work versus having to take out a percentage of that that, you know, so there's things that we believe that socialism, sure, that's left wing capitalism, right when this is meant to be. But I think if you, you're flapping both wings together, mm -hmm. man, this country can elevate and take off. Right. You know, so there's, 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 you know, there's bits of both that we both agree with. But if I'm going to say, you know what, uh, if it's all left to me, the, 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 the tenets and the principles of capitalism is what we resonate with the most. And I think that there's this misperception out there that if you're wealthy, you somehow stepped on somebody's throat to get there. And, and, you know, with you particularly yeah. and with Patrick, I think the reverse is true. You, you've gotten wealthy by helping people and yeah, exactly. by, by really um, taking care of people and treating, you know, the members of your agencies the right way and, and, and getting them motivated to do work for themselves and, and all this different stuff. And, I just think that there's so many misperceptions about what capitalism is, that it's this evil thing, when the reality is it could be the great equalizer. It could be the, the, the real thing that, that, that helps us all to get to where we want to go. A hundred percent. It is a great equalizer and it's provided, the fancy word is economic mobility. That I can start from being broke, but if I understand the principle of capitalism, I can take the little bit of money, the little bit of knowledge I have, apply it, get a return on that money financially and, and entrepreneurially and get myself to the next level. That, that's why guys like us can and go like this and teach others to do the same because we're leading with moral authority of what capitalism has done for us without crossing somebody, without being the, the you know, what was the thing uh, with a Wall Street, that movie Wall Street, you know, greed is good. Greed is good, yeah. Yeah, but to an extent, you know, there, there's, there's greed in all of us. I mean, the reason why people are running over each other on Black Friday is because they're not necessarily buying gifts for other people. They're buying gifts for themselves at the best price. Right, <laughs> that's, right. that, that, that's greed. But if you're using that greed in a, in a, in a positive direction, again, that's what doesn't lead. Because what, what leads in the news today? Crisis, controversy, and conflict. Right. Those three C's. If it bleeds, it leads. Right. Big so, time. Right? Because that sells advertising. That sells eyeballs. You know, uh, and so what we do necessarily isn't what's exposed. Absolutely. Now, I know uh, you're all over social media. You're you're, you're money money smart guy on on Instagram on on uh, um, Twitter as well. Uh, you're also on Facebook, correct? Facebook, yep. LinkedIn, yep. Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and YouTube. Uh, if somebody were to want to inquire about working with you, uh, working with your agency, and things like that, where would they go? Yeah, I'd say go to our, our, our website, Money Smart Guy. 
I have an instru- I have instructional videos on my YouTube page. Uh, we're building a new playlist right now. A couple of new playlists that we're building is, you know, uh, the Money Smart Millionaire series. You know, episodes for veterans and other entrepreneurs and how to get a business, start a business. And one of the videos is very popular for our, uh, is how to start your own independent agency. So I'm, I'm showing the things that we've done in our life to save people time, money, a lot of headache. Uh, if people want to go in business for themselves inside the insurance industry, or those principles are, are, are free to use. If you're having a, you know, a desire to open a coffee shop or, or a restaurant or a, you know, a franchise, it's the same principles because money being money smart, being an entrepreneur, that is a mindset, right? The mindset of a rifle in a Marine's hand is different than a rifle in, in, you know, in a foreign country with some other guy holding the same rifle. Why? Because we, didn't, we have an ethos, morals and values and principles that's behind how we, how we operate as Marines. Right. The, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the honor, courage, commitment, all that stuff behind it. So, but yeah, a much smart guy, we have a place to find me. If you want to get ahead financially and entrepreneurship is a vehicle that you're considering, uh, we have a great series for that. Awesome, Matt. And uh, one more question here. If you could go back to meet the the 18 year old Matt Zapala prior to, to stepping on the yellow footprints prior to, you know, everything, what would you tell him? I say, number one, find the right relationship for your life in terms of girlfriend. How many times we see in the Marine Corps, you know, you get with this girl, this girl, because the hormones are taken over. But listen, man, sex, you're talking about 18 year old Matt, right? Right. Sex is a small part of a relationship. It's the, it's a very important part. But it's a very small part in building a life with someone. Thank God my wife, my wife and I today, we've been together for you know, seven years now. We've been married three and a half, going on four. She has been a godsend to me. Mm-hmm. And as, as much as there's distraction with women, and especially in this world with Instagram, so many girls putting themselves out there, unfortunately, in ways that, you know, aren't, in my opinion, you know, let you know. And Bobby, judge me on that because I'm raising twin girls today that are 17. I'm trying to t- I'm trying to teach values in my kids that you don't get the right eyeballs by putting your ass in, in your flesh up on Instagram. You get you're gonna get the wrong eyeballs. Right. You're gonna get the wrong character. And if you want to build a character, principled, valued, more life, if that's something that you're interested about, Matt, at 18 years old, which I know you have a programming for, that's why you listen to the Marine Corps. Is that you got to find the right personal relationship. And you'll have to not be distracted. So that's why I give a lot of props to like LeBron James, even though I'm not a big basketball fan. And of course, I'm a Jordan fan, right? Chicago. But I give props to LeBron James. You know, you know, there might be things that I may not know. But listen, he's been with the same girl since high school. All this crazy on top of his game, all this money. And he's still with the same girl. Right. All right. All the money in the world, all the power in the world, still with the same woman. Very proud of him. And so I think you, you need to find out what you're looking to attract in love, not just because she's got a cute ass, whatever case may be, a cute face, whatever. That is fleeting. And so I'd be heavy on that because that then will lead you to commitment because I believe just your business life is just an extension of what's going on in your personal life. Right. If you show up your personal life, your, bris- your business will express it. And I think if you get that part of your life, you're, you, you get connected with your spiritual life. Um, you discover what that is, uh, what that means to you, because listen, you can't figure this out all on your own. You think you know a lot, but you don't. Um, but that would be the first couple of things I'd tell my 18 year old self. Yeah. And it's, it's always wise to remember there is nothing that could break you more than a bad relationship or the oh, oh, nothing that can break you. Horrendous. more than that. I'm talking yeah. from vast amounts of experience. With <laughs> Yeah, one of the hardest things to have to deal with, man, is a broken heart. I remember, man, I remember my heart feeling broken very first. You know, big bad marine. I remember sitting in a payphone. Remember, remember back in the day, being a payphone with yep. a phone card, and I just I remember the the the, the helicopter turned. So, Paul, let's go. And I'm just remember just feeling my heart just sink. I'm like, what the hell's going on, uh, dude? Just, especially on Okinawa, man, because oh. it's an island and you can't get off that. Mo- <laughs> you can't get oh. off that thing. <laughs> <laughs> like worst. sitting worst there in Okinawa is like you're you're in this tropical paradise, but after two weeks, it's like what the hell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what base we got in Oki? I was up at Schwab on UDP. Oh. 
<laughs> so sorry for you, brother. There was one woman on the whole base. It was, <laughs> it was awful, man. <laughs> but you know, she sure looked good. It was what it was, man. You know, that just typhoon parties, all that stuff. <laughs> it was uh, poncho liners. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It was good times, man. But uh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's definitely if you're young and you guys are are. are living your life, just live your life. Don't get yourself wrapped up in anything until you have the, the knowledge, the ability and the room for a relationship like that. And that's, yeah. that's uh, advice for, from a couple of old guys. So a bunch of old guys. Yeah. And then, and then you bring a kid and you make a mistake with the wrong woman. You have a kid in the world and then you have conflict for their, at least another 18 years. Mm-hmm. By the time you're our age, you, 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 get, you get wrong. You get a wrong girl. You have a kid with her. You get married. You divorce. Your financial life is ruined. Your military career is set back because it is. You don't think it is, but you know there's a lot of decisions. You can be like I wanted to do MSG. Mm-hmm. I want to become a Marine security guard. I want to. I want to guard an embassy. I couldn't do that being married. You got. You got to be a single guy for three years. Yep. You know. So there's a lot of doors. The, door, the doors are wide open at 18 years old. You make the wrong decision. Boom. A lot of those doors close, and some of them never open back up again. Yeah. No, definitely, man. Definitely. It's, and, uh, you want to stay present on the moment where you are and when you're doing something like laying your life down for this country, you really want to be present. You don't want your mind wrapped up with too much useless crap. So hundred percent. Well, dude, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. It was a real inspiration talking to you. And, um, like I said, I'm going to put all the links to every way to get in touch with you, to get in touch with your awesome. agency, everything like that up on the show notes. Any last words before we go, Matt? You know, listen, I, uh, I, 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 especially in this time in a country where we're at right now, there's a lot of indecisions. There's a lot of, you know, political craziness, you know, racial divide, whatever the case may be. Listen, I, here's one thing. I can care less of what your color is. I just care about if you worry about one color and that color is green. Because you've solved the, the, the money aspect of your life. You solve the personal life. You remove a lot of arguments. You lo- remove a lot of conflict. Out of life. You get the money aspect. You're less squared away. The income, he that controls your income controls your life. If you're able to take back control of your income and who controls it, then you become the master of your own destiny. So, Outstanding. Solid advice. And for everybody out there, you know, Take these notes down. Go. I, I really highly suggest you go over and check out some of Matt's videos and 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 see what he's about even more. And um, you know, apply it and get out there and live your best life while you can. Awesome, brother. I'm putting you on my Instagram stories right now, brother. What's up, everybody? <laughs> We're so podcast right, Chris. Allow me to be on the show. Yeah. Honor, brother. What's going on, everybody? Uh, Awesome, man. Cool. I got you, man.